as your pastor, I am telling you, please, don't waste your time on Wednesday nights watching this television program. If you're looking for Laurel and Hardy here on Wednesday night or Sunday night, I know I've been called that. I left my derby and I left my cane, but I did bring my Bible. If you'll read along with me, you'll find that the persons who are making the accusations, they're really the ones who have a problem. I hear them telling you to shut up, that you're going to be embarrassed, and I even hear them flat out saying, I'm telling you what to do as a pastor. Give me a chance, and I'll give you what does the Bible say. Always ask for, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? New time, Sunday night at 830. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. But apparently you don't know truth because if you know truth, you wouldn't teach your people, watch it, that they're under law of Moses with tithe and mechanical instruments of music. Now you're bringing the tithing over and the instrumental music over. But well, what about the burnt offering? I hear the music, but I don't smell no beef. Where's the beef? Where's the beef? In these churches, they got, in your church, every one of them, they got mechanical music, they teach tithing, right? I don't smell no beef. Where's the beef? You had to go back to the Old Testament to get the music. You had to go back to the Old Testament to get the time. Why didn't you bring in the, the beef? Where's the beef? All the congregation worship. So they were worshiping on the Lord Moses. And they had singers sing, trumpets sound, and all of this continued until the burnt offering was finished. Ask your pastor. Some of you people are watching this television program. Ask your pastor. Hey, where's the beef? Well, I don't think there's anybody back there. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Word of the Lord. James Ofer here with you, and as always, glad for you to be with us. We want to put our contact information up so you can, can know how to reach us and, and uh, uh, examine and study the Bible with us. Hope you brought your Bibles and you're ready for a study from God's Word. Uh, tonight, stay tuned after this program. What does the Bible say? Be coming up uh, at 10 o'clock following this program, and uh, Brother Johnny Robertson will be here, and so we're going to open the phone lines up uh, <clears throat> on both of these programs because we are the people who believe you can examine what we teach and we're not afraid to do that. Uh, some other individuals may be afraid, but nonetheless, that's, uh, that's their prerogative, I guess. They're not doing what the Bible says, but we're uh, certainly inviting you to challenge us and examine what we teach. So if we can assist you in any way, we want to do that very thing. Tonight, friends, I want to continue a lesson that we started last week and uh, we got off kind of on a born in sin or some things like that, but I want to impress upon your mind why it is or some things that people say when it comes to the church of Christ and the fact that the church they're in, they want so badly for it to be the church you read about in the Bible, the church of the New Testament. But the fact of the matter is, friends, many individuals, and I'm saying you watching tonight, are probably in a church that simply uses one particular aspect or one character of the biblical church and therefore you think that it is the church. You think just because you have one aspect of it right, maybe even two, that it is the true church. And I'm here to submit to you that if you will examine the church of the Bible, the church of the New Testament, the church you read about in the Bible, that you will find there's only one kind of church in the Bible. It looks the same no matter where you find it. You find that they are always told to get back and follow one doctrine, one set of rules. You see, that's why when individuals say, well, the, the, the church in Revelation, there were seven churches of Asia. They're all following the same rules. That's why Jesus told some of them to repent. And he told them where they were failing to walk according to the rule. 
So he's giving them information to how to be right and be like the kind of church he wants them to be. That's why when the church of Corinth comes along, it's supposed to be walking by the same rule as the churches of Galatia, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Paul says, if I gave an order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. And these were churches on, on uh, two different continents. So we're trying to get you to realize, friends, that you may be in a church that you think is a church of Christ, that it is part of the great body of Christ, but in reality, it's really not. Now, last week, I think I put these slides up, but I don't think we really talked about it much. I want to emphasize tonight some things about the Presbyterian church. Now, I want you to notice something about this. The church of Christ you read about in the New Testament definitely has presbyters. It has presbyters, but... That does not mean it is the Presbyterian church. Now that word presbyters or Presbyterian, it's kind of a funny word. It's not a word we use all the time unless you're talking about the Presbyterian church, but it is a biblical word. The word presbyters is a biblical word. And in the Bible, what you're going to find is presbyters are bishops. They're elders. They're overseers. They're pastors. They're shepherds. They're all referring to the same group of men. And so what I want to do tonight, let's take our time and let's look at some of these verses and examine what a presbyter is. Because I want to impress upon your minds from the Word of God that a presbyter is the same as all of these other words, a bishop, an overseer, an elder, a pastor, a shepherd, and so forth. So let's look at, let's look at these uh, uh, scriptures. In 1 Timothy, let me get my, my Bible up here. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. Now Paul is going to give some uh, qualifications here. And notice what he says. He says, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. All right, he, he, the, uh, the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. And then he starts giving qualifications for a bishop. A bishop must then be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, uh, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy for the lucre, but patient, not a brawler, covetous, one that ruleth his own house, or ruleth well his own house, having children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being uh, lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the, of the devil. Now, those are just a few of the qualifications that Paul gives for a bishop. Now, stay with me. I want you to look at these verses and we'll, we'll point or we will uh, put together how all of these men or all of these uh, different words, these different titles, if you will, offices, uh, are referring to the same individual. So, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. I want to give you time to jot it down in your paper if you, if you care to note it. Uh, notice it. Now, let's just see what uh, another phrase is here. In 1 Timothy 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14, let's notice what Paul says. He says, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Now there's the word right there, presbytery. The hands of the presbytery. Now the word presbytery is a, is a plural word. word. And the word presbytery actually means the collection of elders. It's the group of elders, the, uh, the, the order of elders. I, don't, I know you can't see that definition, but there's the word. Uh, I, can't, I can't pull it up there. It's, it's a presbyterion, and it is the group of elders. So when you have an elder or an eldership, as sometimes it may be called today, that's the presbytery. So if we, we know what the presbytery is, a group of elders, and we're going to find that the elders and the bishops are the same. All right? So we know what the presbytery is, a group of elders. Let's look at another verse here. Acts 20 and verse, let's don't begin in verse 28. Let's go back to say about verse 17. Acts 20 verse 17. Now, let's see who the elders are. Let's see who the elders are. Let's see who the presbytery is referring to. The presbytery, uh, <clears throat> a group of elders, 
is what we're going to find here in Acts chapter 20. Paul is going to summon, he's going to summon the elders of the church. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the presbyters. He called the elders of the church. Now, you may, uh, you may recall, <clears throat> you may recall that when Paul is writing in Timothy, when Paul is writing to the church at Timothy, you remember what, who he, uh, where Timothy is? In Acts 20, he calls the elders from Ephesus and in 1 Timothy chapter 1, let's go back. Let's just go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1 where he's talking about bishops and where he has spoken of the presbytery. Guess who he's writing to? 1 Timothy chapter 1. Look, who he, uh, look at where, where Timothy is. He says, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. So Timothy's at Ephesus. Timothy's at Ephesus. Paul gives him qualifications for, for bishops, for a bishop, and he says that the presbyteries there. Now, presbyteries are a group of elders. Well, when we get to Acts chapter 20 and verse 17, guess who Paul is talking to? Paul is sending for the elders from Ephesus. He's sending for the presbytery. The group of elders, he's calling them from, from Ephesus to come meet him at Miletus. Now, listen to what he says to them. And when they were come to him, who they, the presbytery, the elders, when they were come, he said unto him, to them, Ye know from the first day that I came to Asia, after that manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mine and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying, by the lying in wait of the Jews." And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the elders, the presbytery from Ephesus. He says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit into Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnessed in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither can I myself count on my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of grace, uh, 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 testify the gospel of the grace of God. Verse 25, And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching, the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day, that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Remember, he's still talking to the elders, the presbytery from Ephesus. And he says, verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Paul is talking to the elders the presbytery from Ephesus, and he has told Timothy that the bishops are to be qualified in a certain manner. So the bishops at Ephesus had to have certain qualifications, and he sent for these bishops or this eldership or this presbytery from Ephesus to come to them, and look what he says to them. Paul says to the presbytery, to the elders, that God hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, let's notice some things here. In this verse, in this passage, in Acts chapter 20, verses 17 through 28, I want you to notice something, friends, that Paul says that the elders are the presbytery, that God has made them, watch it, he has made them uh, uh, overseers. Let me get down here to where I'm looking. Episcopos. Episcopos. Now, that's where we get the word Episcopalian. Now, that brings up another idea of a church, doesn't it? Another kind of, of man-made church. But Paul says, to the presbyters, God has made you overseers. God has made you overseers. And what are you supposed to do, Paul? What are the overseers supposed to do? 
to feed, to feed, here's the word, and guess what that word is? That word's pastor. So Paul tells the elders or the presbytery that God has made them overseers, episkopos, and that they are to feed or to pastor the church of God. Now, all you Presbyterians out there, if you're using the term correct, Paul says to the presbyters of Ephesus, God's made you Episcopalians. God's made you Episcopos. God made the presbyters overseers so that they could pastor, and here they were elders. Do you see how God is using these terms, friend? When someone comes along and tells you that bishops and elders and overseers and pastors and shepherds are different, that tells you, that ought to tell you right there that they don't know the Bible. They don't know, they don't know the Scripture. Because presbyters are bishops. Paul calls them elders. Says that God made them overseers. And they're supposed to pastor the flock which makes them shepherds. And the only time the word pastor is used in the Bible, there's in Ephesians 4 and verse 11. Ephesians 4 and verse 11. And let's notice what that word means. Ephesians 4 verse 11. Let's look and see what word God uses there. God made some to be pastors. Right here it is. Poimen. Well, that's the same word or the root of the word that we just saw back in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. God told the presbyters to be overseers and to be pastors, to pastor the flock. So in Acts 4, excuse me, Ephesians 4, verse 11, Ephesians 4, verse 11, you have pastors who Paul has said that the presbyters are supposed to do that, the elders are supposed to do that, the bishops are supposed to do that. And then in 1 Peter chapter 5, look what Paul says. Paul says to the elders, presbyteros, which are among you, I exhort, whom also am an elder, I am one of the presbyteros, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Uh, what are they supposed to do, Peter? Peter, what are the elders supposed to do? Look at verse 2, 1 Peter 5 and verse 2. He says, feed, poyamano, feed, pastor the flock of God. You see, the presbyteros, the presbytery, the Presbyterians of the church are supposed to feed the flock. Now, if, if you've got a Presbyterian church, that means you have a church full of elders. It means you must have a whole bunch of elders in that church. Everybody has to be an elder in the church. But everybody can't be an elder in the church, friends, because elders have to have certain qualifications. Everybody can't be a presbyter in the Presbyterian church because they all have to have qualifications. See, the only way this can be a Presbyterian church is if everybody's an elder, if everybody's a bishop, if everybody is a shepherd, if everybody is an overseer, if everybody's a pastor. This can't be that way. Why? Because God has given qualifications for a presbyter, for an elder. There's no such thing as a Presbyterian church in the Bible. There's a such thing as presbyters in the church, but no such thing as a church full of presbyters. Notice this. They have to meet God's standard. They have to meet God's standard. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, we'll go back to that verse. That's where we, where we are. 1 Timothy 3, that's where we started to mean. 1 Timothy 3, in verse 1, this is the true saying of a man desire the office of a bishop. If he desires the office of an overseer, if he desires the office of a shepherd, of an elder, of a pastor, he desires a good work. Bishops, elders, presbyters, overseers, they're all the same. The other day a man, man called me, he said, are you a, 
He said, are you, are you married? He's, and then he corrected himself. He said, yeah, I know you have to be because you preach. And I said, no, I don't have to be. I don't have to be because I am a preacher. I'm an evangelist. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a pastor. See, I'm just an evangelist. I'm one who preaches the gospel. The pastor is the one who meets qualifications, and therefore he is an overseer. He's a shepherd. He is a bishop. He is a presbyter, one of the presbytery. So they have to make qualifications. Now notice, a bishop must then be blameless, the husband of one wife. Let me tell you, if someone comes up to your door, and maybe they're, say they're, let's say they're, what, riding on a bicycle, let's say, and they're wearing a little white shirt, maybe a black tie, and they come knock on your door, and they say, hi, I'm elder so-and-so. And they look like they're 18 years old. I can assure you they're not a biblical elder. Folks in Latter-day Saints, they're not elders. They're youngers, maybe. They're, they're not elders. Not in the biblical sense, they're not. Not using the biblical term, they're not elders. Because an elder must be the husband of one wife. And these guys are single. Folks in the, in the Mormon church don't use the word correctly. And I know everybody dogs on the poor Mormons. The Latter-day Saints. Everybody gets off, gets, uh, gets, uh, 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 off on, 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 on down and out the Mormons. Everybody just jumps on the bandwagon. Yeah, they, they're not using it right. They're not scriptural. They're not using it right. Well, you know what? The Mormons aren't using the terms right, and neither are the Presbyterians. See? The Presbyterian church does not meet the, the presbyters in the Presbyterian church don't meet the qualifications of a, of a bishop any more than the elders in the Mormon church because a bishop and a presbyter and an elder all have the same qualifications, the husband of one wife. And there's no way in the world, I don't care how you slice it or dice it, cut it, shred it or separate it, you cannot make a boy who is not married an elder or a bishop and you can't make a woman a bishop or a presbyter or an elder or a pastor. You just can't do it. So you say, well, What's the, what are presbyters? Presbyters presbyters are elders. They're bishops. Now, I've already shown you that an elder is the same as a presbyter. See, Paul said laying on the hands of the presbytery, 1 Timothy 4, verse, 11, uh, verse 14. 1 Timothy 4, 14, the presbytery. And then Paul, Peter said in 1 Peter 5, verse 1, that he was an elder or he wrote to the elders, the presbyteros, which is the same word. You see how the Bible can be its own best commentary? I'll tell you what, folks. If you'll just pick up the Bible, it'll shed a whole lot of light on some of these man-made doctrines and creed books. You can learn a lot from the Bible if you'll just put aside all these other man-made books and start using biblical terms and biblical ways. A bishop, an elder, a presbyter are the same, and they have the same qualifications. And if you have someone in the church in the church you're in, who calls themselves an elder, or maybe they call themselves a pastor, or maybe they call themselves a bishop, or maybe they call themselves a presbyter, they have to meet these qualifications, or they don't, or they're not presbyters like God talks about. You see, God says bishops and elders have to have these qualifications. And notice, in Titus 1, verses 6 through 9, Titus 1, verse uh, 6, Let's look at verse 6. Paul said, well, let's back up to verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. All right, how are you going to do this, Timoth uh, Titus? How are you going to ordain elders, as Paul appointed? Well, you have to find men that are qualified. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of right and unruly. Why? For a bishop must be blameless. Now he just said ordained elders. Why is he giving qualifications for a bishop? Because they're the same. See, they're the same. See how simple it is, friends? If you just open up the Bible, oh, it'll just, it'll just uh, make so much sense. 
If you just put aside, put take the denominational glasses off your off your off your faces as you're reading and just read the Bible, it'll make so much sense. An elder is a bishop and they have to be qualified. Now, if I look at the Presbyterian Church, and that's what we're discussing, if I look at the Presbyterian Church, I know that the Presbyterian Church is not the Church of Christ. It may have presbyters in it, just like the Church of Christ is organized in such a way that God says if you have individuals who are qualified, you will have presbyters. You'll have elders. You'll have bishops. You'll have pastors. You'll have overseers. You'll have shepherds. Because they'll all be the same men. They'll all meet the same qualifications. Now watch this. You know how I know the Presbyterian Church is not the Church of Christ? I know it's not because I hear what people say. And I see what goes on. Notice this. Here is a, uh, let me see if I pull it up here. Uh, this is uh, from the website of the First Presbyterian Church in Eden. And notice, it says church officers. And right here it says elders. And I'm just going to scroll down. Keep in mind, these are elders. These are presbyters. These are overseers. These are bishops, shepherds, according to the Bible. That's the, that's the term. We're going to, you know, uh, forgive me for using a biblical term in the biblical way. But these are elders, bishops, overseers, shepherds, pastors, presbyters. That's what we're talking about. And in the Presbyterian church, as we scroll down, notice we see a couple of men here. There's a couple more guys. and all the, whoa, whoa, two women? Now, wait a minute. Elders? Women elders? That's just as wrong as women pastors. Or women bishops. You can't have women elders, women pastors, women bishops. Well, you can in the Presbyterian church, but you can't in the Lord's church. Because the Presbyterian church is not the Lord's church. You see, it's not organized the same way. You have to go to another book. You have to go to the Presbyterian Catechism in, uh, 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 in order to, uh, if you're going to find women elders or women presbyters in the church. And if you scroll on down, man, they just, they have, I, I just, I didn't even think to count them. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, seven. Let's come on down, eight, nine, ten. There's ten presbyters, women presbyters, in the Presbyterian church. That right there tells me, friends, that the Presbyterian church is not the church of Christ because the church of Christ that you read about in this book, the Lord's church, would never have a woman bishop, a woman presbyter, a woman elder, a woman overseer because the, qualific the qualifications will not allow it. They just will not allow it. Again, if they be blameless, the husband of one wife. Now, out there in California, they voted on it. And I think they voted on it in several places, trying to make, make it possible for a woman to have a wife. No, you might can do it up in Vermont. You might do it in Massachusetts or Hawaii, but you won't be doing it in the Lord's Church. I don't care how many laws they pass. I don't care if they make it legal. I don't care if they change the amendments of the Constitution to say that a woman can marry a woman. She still won't be the husband of one wife there still will not be any way, shape, or form you can have a woman bishop. And see, the reason why the Presbyterian Church allows women elders is because they don't know the terms. They don't understand the nature of the biblical term that they use for their name. There's no way a woman can be the husband of one wife. Now, I, I'll tell you, friends, are you sure you want to say that the church you're in is the church you read about in the Bible, given the fact that it's not even organized the same, that it's not, uh, that it, it doesn't agree with what the Bible says. And you know what the, th the strange thing is? When people start talking about elders and bishops, presbyters, when, when their teaching and their belief doesn't line up with the Bible, you know what they say? They start blaming the Bible. Listen to what this lady says. We were talking about a man who had a fiancé, a man who claimed to have, be a bishop. He claimed to be a bishop, a presbyter, pastor, 
an elder, an overseer, a shepherd. He claimed to be a bishop. And he then said that he, was, he had a fiancé. Now, friends, we just read the qualification. Husband of one wife. Now, I don't know about you, but you're not the husband of one wife if you've got a fiancé. If you do, you know, your wife's going to be upset. But listen to what the converse, how the conversation went with this lady who was trying to defend a man being a bishop, presbyter, elder, overseer, shepherd, and not married, not had a wife, but just a fiancé. Listen to how it went. You know what does the Bible say? Hello? You're, you're on, you're on what does the Bible say? Okay, the man that was sitting out talking, did he say his girlfriend and her children? His, his, his fiancée fiance and, and her his children. children. Right. Yes. Well, he is, is he a minister? Uh, is he a minister? No, he's a bishop, he claims. Oh, well, have he ever been married? Well, the, if, if he has been married and he's no longer the husband of one wife, he's disqualified. But when you divorce, you you not when you divorce a person that's not your wife. Well, that's, just, that's exactly you're, that's, you're making that's, our that's, point. That's, that's you're exactly, exactly right. right. He doesn't have a wife anymore. That's right. And as long as he doesn't have a wife and a house to rule, so that that we can see that he knows how to do that, then he's not qualified until he gets another one. And if he was, and if he's living with this woman. And I'm saying if that, I know, but I'm saying if if he's saying that's his house, then that then he's still he's still breaking another command, you know, because that's not his wife. He just admitted it's not his wife. Well, you, is you saying you can't have a girlfriend? No, no, no. We're saying that if you do not have a wife, you do not qualify for First Timothy chapter three, verse one, an elder or bishop. Oh, you have to be married. Well, the Bible says so. I mean, you can do what you want to do. Isn't that right? I mean, people do it all the time. I mean, and but God forgive you for divorce. Well, we well we're not talking that. about divorce. We're talking about. I don't even know if that gentleman's divorced. Do you? I don't know. That's what I'm asking you. Well, I, I know one thing. Well, upon this we can agree. He does not have a wife right now because he has a or, fiance. He didn't at that time. Yeah, at that time. How are you gonna get a wife if you don't have a fiance? That's not the point, ma'am. The point is, he said he was a bishop. At that time, he said he was a bishop, and the Bible says, First Timothy it three, is. verse it one is. and two. Is a true saying, if a man desired the office of a bishop, he desires a good work, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Now, who was his wife? Well, you talk like you got two wives. No, no. I said, who's his wife? Well, he can't be a... Just because he don't have a wife, he can't be a bishop? That's what That's the right. Bible says. Well, maybe the Bible ain't right. <laughs> Well, I don't understand that. How are you going to ever get a wife? Well, the you, thing is, you don't can, become a bishop until you get a wife. That's right. You just you just wait until you get married, and then you hear that, folks. Well, maybe, maybe the Bible ain't right. Now, isn't, that, isn't that a shame? When someone instead of just admitting or just go ahead and, and agreeing, or siding with uh, the Bible on a matter, instead of siding with the Bible, she just turned around and said, "Well, maybe the Bible is not right." Now, I just I just don't know if I could uh, live with myself. Here she's trying to defend a man who is uh, claiming to be a bishop, a presbyter, an elder, a shepherd, an overseer, all the same, has a fiancé, and the woman says, well, maybe the Bible ain't right. Well, I'll tell you what, that's the way people look at it when they try to make their doctrine fit God's Word. It just won't work, though, friend. And folks in the Presbyterian Church are no different. They are trying to fit their doctrine. They're trying to fit their doctrine into the Bible, and it just won't go. There's just no room left in the Bible for you to, to, to squeeze women elders or women presbyters into the Bible. It just won't fit. And all this happened back in the 70s when they, when they uh, uh, decided that they were going to let women be elders in the Presbyterian Church. Well... That tells me right there, friends, that the Presbyterian Church is not the Church of Christ. And you know what? When it gets right down to it, they'll agree with you. They'll agree with that statement. I want you to go to a Presbyterian preacher who's going to agree with what I, what I say about the Presbyterian Church not being the church you read about in the Bible. All right? You're on the word of the Lord. Uh, yes. I wish you all would stop so much fighting.
and teach people how to love and to it's just no time for all this stuff y'all are talking you know sir i wish i wish you people start calling in and telling us to stop fighting and love us you know now what's the difference in what we're doing and what you're doing can you tell me? You all just, I mean, it's like you condemn everybody. Well, it's you're everything con are you condemning you me? you finding something wrong with. Sir, I are just, you condemning me? Am I doing something well, wrong? But I'm saying you need, you, the message you all are preaching is not drawing anybody. It's well, just, the message you're preaching is not drawing me. On other, it's putting down other churches well, and you're other putting pastors me down. and bishops and all this. Are you putting me down? Just stop it. Are you putting me down? Hello? See? Oh, I just, you know, these people... You know, these people just don't love us. You know, they are always putting us down. And it's not drawing me to them. They're not showing me love and compassion. You know, I wish they'd, they'd learn some love and compassion. You want to wear my Lord? Yeah, how you doing, Jim? I'm doing fine. Will you show me some love, please? <laughs> well, yeah. Um, it, to me, it's love to show the truth of God's word. I mean. Well, thank you. I mean, God is love and God is truth. Um, you know, you're not bringing up one thing, and it's not the Presbyterian Church that I'm talking about, but I've got an article in front of me regarding the Anglican Church. And their issue right now is they're, they're having a divide because of homosexual bishops, and some believe that they should allow them to be, and some within the Anglican Church say that, no, they shouldn't. So I guess, you know, the last caller would say, well, that's okay, too. Quit talking about those as well. And who knows what's next? I guess you shouldn't talk well, about the pedophile priest in the Catholic Church or right. anything else. Well, the Presbyterians are actually going through that same divide, too. There's a big push in the Presbyterian Church to, excuse me, allow homosexuals in, too. Now, I don't think they haven't, they haven't got to that point yet. But that's, that's, a, that's a big uh, push in the Presbyterian Church, too. So it's, it's the Anglican and the Presbyterian Church and the, the Episcopalian Church and the Baptists. They're all dealing with it. The Methodists, they're all dealing with homosexuals. I, but the, I think the Methodists have already let them in. So I can see what's going to happen when states, you know, uh, if they get to the point and they are to some extent allowing same-sex marriages, well, then were they going to say, well, he is a husband of one husband. Or I mean a husband of one wife, even though they're the same sex. And then people would be calling and say, well, you shouldn't really talk about that. You know, it's right. being kind if you point out that, you know, they're uh, in a same-sex marriage. And we can change the terms of husband and wife now. And right. pretty soon you're back to the Tower of Babel. Right. Let's, let's just, don't, don't confuse us with the facts. In other words, let's, let us do our own thing. Yeah, and so, you know, I don't know, like, the last gentleman, would, would he... It seems like he would say that, yeah, you can be a homosexual bishop, and that's okay, too, as long as you say you, you, you love Jesus. Well, he'd have to, I mean, and that's the thing. If anybody, if anybody condemns anybody else, then, you know, I mean, if you can't condemn anything, then you, anything has to go. I mean, that's just, that's just the bottom line. So, and if anything can go, well, then just toss away your Bible and do whatever you want. Yeah, that's right. Why do we need the Bible? Exactly right. Thank you. Well, thanks for your call. You're on the word from the Lord. Hey, what's up, man? Good evening. I've been watching you a long time. I've been following you, and I just uh, I want to ask you a question because I like listening to your program and watching it. Okay. What do you see just happen in the world? I'm sorry? History was just made, right? Okay. History was made. And what does it have to do with? with it's got a lot to do with it if you was God's leader, Okay. You've if, seen millions of people come together. Even in your heart, you feel the same way we feel or us feel about our president. I know you do. I see it in you. So why all this division is coming between Presbyterian, Apostolic, and all this different stuff when we're all united as one? Sir, we're, we're not all united as one. Why? Do you think the Presbyterian Church is united with it's the just Baptist a name. Church? It's just a name. We are people. Then why then why are we divided? Ben, you are the same. Are you are you telling me, sir, that just because we're all people that we're unified? Do you think that you are? No. No, no I don't think we are. No? I don't I don't think I don't think the Presbyterians are united with the Baptists one bit. So is the Baptist united with the Apostolic? No. So Presbyterian is top notch. No. I'm not saying that. Are we in a competition? Well, apparently they are because they, apparently they are in a competition to see who can build the bigger building. 
So, I'm saying, sir, what's dividing us is, I, I sir. Mean, I, I listen to you. I want you to understand. Okay. All right. Well, well li me listen, listen to me now here. here. Here's what I'm saying, sir. What's dividing us is people won't get back to this book. The Presbyterians, the Presbyterians uh, have women elders. Now, the Baptists are struggling with that. I know. But the Presbyterians and the Baptists don't get along, and the Baptists and the Apostolics don't get along because they don't teach the same thing. Don't say just because we all love God that we're all unified. The Baptists teach that baptism is immersion, and the Methodists say it's sprinkling, so they don't get along. The Apostolics would say that there's one in the Godhead, and the Baptists would say there's three. They're not going to get along. So I don't know why you think that they have unity just because, you know, why, why would you think they have unity? They're all divided. Now, do, would you care to address that? If they're all unified, why are they so divided? You said, why do we have unity? They don't have unity. You've seen it last night. Millions of different I didn't people see in the unity. world. I didn't see unity. But now, listen, you're going to hang up on me again. No, I'm not. I put you on hold. You're hanging, you're hanging but, 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 sir, but, sir, listen, listen. This listen. happened last I listen to you. Sir, that's not unity. I can't cut you off, so you listen to me. I know, but I'm saying, what does that have to do with what we're discussing? What do with it? Because you saying to me, this man that became president, he was he just wasn't for the white man, the Chinese man, the black man, that man, that man. Well, do you say that about every president that's elected? Look, you telling me not not the world, but you telling me somebody I listen to that it's a different issue between praise and God. I'm exa I, I'm I'm saying that so people saying don't that people me, don't I, praise I don't God. Understand that. I'm sorry. It really confuses me because, like I said, I listen to you all the time. Well, I'm trying to tell you, sir, just because. Just because someone claims to be loving God doesn't mean that they're unified. Yeah, but you making them love you in a sense, right? I'm, I'm not. I don't want them to love me. I want them to love the truth. Okay. Well, I just wanted to address that. I'm not going to go deep. Okay. That. All I right. Appreciate calling. Thanks for your call. And I, I don't really know what the election had to do with it. I don't think. I mean, if if electing someone president, I don't care what color he is. If that means that we're all unified, then we've elected what 42 presidents before that. And I don't see, I didn't know that that unified the country. We're not going to be unified based upon some man being president, no matter who the next one is. There's still going to be people, people who are going to have ideological differences, and they're not going to be unified, just like in religion. People in the Presbyterian Church are not going to be unified with the Baptist on, on ideology unless they give up what makes them Presbyterians or what makes them Baptists. Somebody has to give up something in order to be the same as everybody else when it comes to doctrine that they teach. All right? You're going to work from the Lord. How are you tonight? I'm fine. That's good. I have one question to ask you. Okay. Um, if a person had been an elder or a bishop for, let's say, 30 years, for example, and their wife dies, are you saying that they're no longer an elder or bishop? Yes, ma'am. The Bible says it must be the husband of one wife. Okay. So if, if I mean, when, when the spouse dies, when the wife dies, is she still the wife? No. Okay, so the husband of one wife, he, he, he's no longer an elder because he's not the husband of one wife. Okay, so then what does he become? He just becomes a man. Just a, just a minister. Well, or just whatever. He, 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 can't be, he can't be called a bishop, not biblically, he can't be a bishop because he doesn't meet the qualifications. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks for the call. Now, see, that's pretty simple. I mean, that's pretty simple. When you're not qualified, you're not qualified, right? All right. Uh, so, all right, we got to, you on the word from the Lord? Hey, good evening. How you doing? I'm fine. That's good. Nice, nice talking to you. Uh, the caller before the last, uh, uh, I don't know how in the world anybody could say there is uh, unity in this country. This is the most uh, diverse, divided country in the world. And uh, well, let's let's stay on. Let's stay okay, on. Okay, that's, that's what I'm getting ready to okay. do. That's what that's what I, I believe me. I'm going to stay on course right. here. And uh, you know, uh, we we do live in the Bible Belt of America, and I'm 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 absolutely uh, I'm absolutely glad for that. And uh, I was going to tell you, um, you know, he was talking about, uh, 
everybody is uh, everybody's come together whatsoever. And I know y'all preach, you know, the Presbyterians fight the Baptists and the Methodists against the holiness and everybody's against the uh, everybody. That is the truth. And if he, he actually believed that everybody's united and everybody believes together, why is, he, why is, why is there so many different churches? I, I, that, that's, that's, a good, that's a question oh, yeah. Question for the ages. If everybody's unified. There's not supposed to be but one church. That's, and that's right. The, well, I, I agree with you. That is, that is the church of Christ, the body of Christ it's supposed to be. But, but here's the thing. All denominations are not in that body. Oh, well, well I absolutely, I absolutely uh, agree. I, absolutely I don't agree care if it's that. the Baptist body, the Methodist body, Lutheran body, Presbyterian body, Apostolic body, Mormon body. You know, Muslim body, what, they're, they're not in the Church of Christ. Yeah, and uh, you know, I hear y'all uh, teach a whole lot, too, about uh, people taking on these titles as reverends and bishops and whatever. Nowhere in the Bible does that uh, does that authorize anybody to take on that title. Right, that's right, that's right. Oh, yeah, and absolutely, uh, I, I was uh, going somewhere one time, and, uh, and I got to talking to this preacher, give himself that name, the Reverend. I said, where in the world? I said, where did you come up with that title at? He said, well, that's what I am. I said, no, you're not, neither. Not according to God's word, you're not. But I just had, I had to, I was sitting here listening, like I said, before that caller, before last, and I'm going to tell you what, um, I'm going to tell you what, uh, ignor ignorance ab abounds in this country, it really does. Keep well, up the good work, right, God bless you. Right. Well, <clears throat> um, yeah, ignorance is one of our most exp uh, expensive commodities we have in this country. But now, friends, this is why I want to show you. The Presbyterian Church is not the Church of Christ. And I want you to listen to what this preacher says, this Presbyterian preacher. This is Jeff Black. And this is what he says about the Presbyterian Church when he's asked about its being essential to a man's salvation. Um. Was, do you have to be in the Presbyterian Church to be saved? No, sir. So it's not essential. Your church is not essential. For salvation, membership in the Presbyterian Church is essential to salvation? Absolutely not. Is the church? That's not what he asked. He said Presbyterian. We'll go ahead and ask it then. Don't put words in the man's through. mouth. Sir? Well. Uh, you know what he's getting at, and I know what he's getting at, and you're saying that... I, I don't, know, I don't okay. even know who he is. Are, I don't know what he's church, getting at. You have to be church in order to be saved. You have to be in the church of Jesus Christ to be saved. So why are you in the Presbyterian church? That's what he's asking. Amen. Why are you in a church that Jesus did not die for, was not mentioned in the Bible, did not start till 1,600 years later, uh, and Jesus didn't die for? Why are you in a church like that? It's not essential. You have to be in a body be in of believers. So yes, the church is of vital importance. But what you're saying is is you're including all denominations as the Lord's church? No, sir. They must teach what the Bible teaches. For salvation, membership in the Presbyterian Church is essential to salvation? Absolutely not. You have to be in the church of Jesus Christ to be saved. So why you have to be in a body be in of believers. For salvation, membership in the Presbyterian Church is essential to salvation? Absolutely not. You have to be in the church of Jesus Christ to be saved. So why you have to be in a body be in of believers. So yes, the church is of vital importance. For salvation, membership in the Presbyterian Church is essential to salvation? Absolutely not. You have to be in the church of Jesus Christ to be saved. So, why so you what you're saying is, is you're including all denominations as the Lord's church? No, sir. They must teach what the Bible teaches. For salvation, membership in the Presbyterian Church is essential to salvation? Absolutely not. You have to be in the church of Jesus Christ to be saved. So why now, now, friends, I know we repeated that a lot, but I want you to listen to what he said. You don't have to be in the Presbyterian Church to be saved, but you do have to be in the Church of Christ, a body of believers, you see. And so doesn't that by... By definition, then exclude the Presbyterian Church if you don't have to be in that. I mean, let's put it let's put it together this way. He was asked, "What was essential to salvation?" He said, "A church of Jesus Christ. You have to be in a church of Jesus Christ to be saved. You have to be in a body of believers. You have to be in a church that teaches what the Bible teaches. Those are essential to salvation. That describes the church you have to be in to be saved." But then when he was asked, well, what about the Presbyterian Church? No, sir, you don't have to be a member of the Presbyterian Church. Well, thank you very kindly. That means the Presbyterian Church is not essential to salvation. 
You see, you can't say this is essential and this not essential and then turn around and say that this is the same as this. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It can't be, it can't not be the church and be the church. So what is non-essential to salvation? Well, membership in the Presbyterian church. If you're going to be saved, you don't need to be a member of the Presbyterian church. But if we look at what is essential to salvation, look what we find, friends. We find a man saying, a Presbyterian preacher, a scholar, he says, the Presbyterian church is not then a body of believers because you have to be in a body of believers to be saved. Therefore, the Presbyterian church is not a body of believers. You have to be in a church that teaches what the Bible teaches, but you don't have to be in a Presbyterian church. Therefore, the Presbyterian church is not a church that teaches what the Bible teaches, and I can assure you we've already seen that tonight. They have women presbyters, women elders, and that's not what the Bible teaches. So if you're in the Presbyterian church, rest assured, my friend, you're not in a church that's going to save you. You're not in a church that's essential to your salvation. You're not a member of a body of believers. You're not in a church that teaches what the Bible teaches. You're not in a church of Christ. Now, please don't try to tell me that you're okay. You see? If you, if you don't have to be a member of the Presbyterian church to be saved, then don't turn around and say that you're in the church of Christ. And I would love for someone from the Presbyterian Church to call in and tell me that the Presbyterian Church is essential to salvation. I mean, if it is, I'd like to know it. You see? So, you see how it is, friends? When you start saying you are the church of Christ, you immediately start finding contradiction between what you teach and what the Bible teaches. And when you examine more closely, you're going to find, you know what, I'm, 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 I'm really not. In the church, I read about in the Bible. The Presbyterian Church is not the New Testament church. Let that phone call through if they won't want to come. So, <clears throat> so this is what we're talking about, friends. See how simple it is? The Presbyterian Church, the Church of Christ, does have presbyters in it. I mean, it is authorized to have presbyters. Paul said, set it in order. Uh, actually, he said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, excuse me, 1 Tim, uh, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, notice what he says. He said, I besought thee to abide at Ephesus, uh, that thou mightest charge him to teach no other doctrine. What are you going to do, Timothy, while you're there? You're going to uh, uh, teach some, uh, charge him to teach no other doctrine. And one of the things that he was to teach was uh, the qualification of elders and install men there. You're on the word from the Lord. Yeah, I just had a quick question for you. Okay. Uh, what I, it, I, I've, I've been uh, diagnosed with terminal cancer. Okay. And, uh, I've got probably two weeks or so, uh, 30 days maybe, the doctor said uh, to live. And I've never really been in a church, uh, never really spent much time in a religion. And wondering if, if, if I go tonight, what, what specifically if I'm going to go, you know, if I die between now and morning, what do I have to do to go to heaven? Okay. Fair mm -hmm. question. Let me just give you let me give you the Bible so that uh, you'll know it's not coming from me. You come it's coming from from the Bible. <clears throat> Romans ten seventeen. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So you have to hear the gospel. All right. Now, the okay. next thing the Bible says is you have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. In uh, Acts, 50, Acts 15, 7, Peter said that by his mouth God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So you hear the word and you believe. Okay. Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes. Okay. So now that you believe that, Notice, you have to repent of your sins. Acts 17, verse 30. Paul said, God commanded all men everywhere to repent. You have to repent of not serving the Lord, not being obedient to him, which would include not being a member of his church, of the church that Christ died for. Repent of your sins. 
confess Christ before man, which you just did. You just confessed that you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's what the eunuch did. The eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then you have to be baptized for the remission of sins. Notice Acts 2 and verse 38. Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized to everyone in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. There's no Baptist preacher or any other preacher will tell you that it's for the remission of sins. They'll say you're saved before. But Peter said it is for the remission of sins. Now, that's pretty simple. That's pretty simple. That's what you have to do to be saved. Now, my question, can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, how long have you been diagnosed? First time I was there about about two months ago. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, I, I know they I know you just signed up for the correspondence course, so I'm I'm concerned about that because you may not get the time to finish the correspondence course. Hopefully I will. You know. So uh, what I would say, sir, is why tarest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins? The Lord will add you to His church. Acts two verse forty seven. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Verse 41 says, They that gladly received his word were baptized. And then verse 47 says, The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So. So daily. So I'm, I'm saying the Lord such as should be saved. In other words, on a daily basis, people were being baptized for the remission of sins, and the Lord was adding them. So in other words, in the church of Christ, men don't vote you in. You know, they don't vote on you to decide whether you're going to be a member or not. If you do what the Lord says, the Lord puts you in. Now, that's the, that's the difference in the Lord's church and a man-made church. So, my question is, why te again, why tarest thou if you, you know, if you, don't, if you don't know how long you have to live, but you know it's a short time, why tarest thou? I didn't have, what if I didn't have time to be bad? Let's say I go tonight. Well, I'm just saying, you, you know what you need to do, so why wait? Tonight? Why? Why not? Who would I get to do that? Well, I would come out and do it. Look at this right here. In Acts, 13, in Acts 16. Acts 16. Uh, sorry, Acts 16. I had 20. <clears throat> Verse 25. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises of God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison was shaken, and immediately all... The doors were open and everyone's bands were loose. What time was it? Midnight. Midnight. The doors opened up. The, pri the keeper of the prison, awakened out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had, fled, had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. He's, he called for a light, sprang in, and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. <coughs> And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, here's a man that asked the same question you did. Now, they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. But what does it take to believe? It takes hearing, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So if, if he's going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, someone who's never heard about Jesus Christ, guess what he's going to need? He's going to need to hear. So verse 32, they spake unto him the word of the Lord. To all the widows of the house, he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, their works meet for repentance, Acts 26, 20, and was baptized, he and all he is straightway. Now, this was at midnight. Okay, but didn't that happen after he was saved? No. Remember, we just read Acts 2, 38. Baptism for the remission of sin. Believe. He said, what must I do? He said, believe. But he didn't know, he didn't know who Jesus was. Well, he asked, what must I do to be saved? He must know something. Well, he was, he was fixing to die. He knew that if the prisoners escaped, he was going to be put to death. So he said, what must I do? And they said, believe. And then they told him words whereby he could believe. They spake to him the word of the Lord. Now tell me, now tell me, where, tell me where you see salvation in this verse other than just believe. Because my Bible says over here, in Acts 2, Acts... I don't see it in 33 either, though. I'm sorry? I don't see it in 33 either. They took him the same night and washed his stripes and baptized he and all his. He was baptized. But that doesn't say saved. Well... believe and you be saved. 
Well, but right here says, Acts 2.38, He that believe it, uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin. Here's salvation right here, after baptism. Acts 22.16. Acts 22.16, notice this. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sin. See, baptism always comes before salvation, never after. If you have any doubt about, about the Philippian jailer there in Acts 16, just look at everybody else that obeyed the gospel. They were baptized first and then saved. If you want to obey the gospel tonight, sir, I'll come out. Where, where do you live? I live in South Hill, but uh, where? I'm in Danville tonight. In Danville? Yes. Well, we got brethren in Danville. We got brethren in Danville right now. I, I can call two brethren and they come out to your house. Or I'd come. I'd come. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I, I was just kind of wondering. I mean, you want to? You want to? You want to? Is that the most important thing in life, right there? Well, if you're worried about your, if you're worried about dying with in your sins, Jesus said, if you die in your sins, you can't go where He is. Right. Well, what I mean, after you, after you saved and baptized, or baptized and saved, what, what's the most important thing after that? Well, to to remain faithful, to live to live. To live faithful to God, keep His commandments, and die uh, faithful to the Lord. Romans, uh, Revelation two ten. Jesus said, "Be thou faithful unto death." Right here, be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. I mean, it's not a, it's not a once saved always saved thing. It's a it's a continual walk. Excuse me, First John. First John. 1 verse uh, 7. If we walk in the light as he's in the light, it's a continual process. We have fellowship one with another between God and the blood of Jesus Christ. His son cleanses us from all sin. See, that's where we, co we continue to come into the contact with blood that cleanses us. What about Peter, though? Didn't Peter? What about Peter? Didn't Peter deny Christ? Yeah, what about him? He, he still he still could be saved. He repented. We're not saying you don't you don't have a need to repent after you're baptized, but you now you get the blessing of repenting of your sins and letting the blood of Christ forgive your sins. Verse nine here, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But this is only this is talking to people who have already obeyed the gospel. Why don't you let me put you on hold and we'll continue this conversation. Well, I mean, I, I guess I just kind of wonder, I mean, if the most important thing is for you, I mean, for you, a man, you know, a preacher, is, is to, you know, to make sure that people, you know, that they go to heaven when they die, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Then why you would spend so much time, you know, talking about other, you know, religions and well, sir, because, well, let me Well, that's just the get, number one thing. Well, because here's the thing. Salvation... Did you hang up? All right, I don't know. Well, I'll just answer that man's question. Here's why. Because salvation is in the church, and Christ is the head of the church and the Savior of the body. The church is the body, the body is the church. Christ is going to save the church of Christ. Not the Presbyterian church. It's not in the Bible. Friends, so we're going to wrap up. Uh, I don't know. I hope the man, if he, if he got hung up, I hope he'll call back. If he's really concerned about his salvation, I hope he'll call back. Friends, we're going to wrap up. Stay tuned for what does the Bible say coming up next. Until next time, make sure you're not getting what man says. Make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night. He was a nut. Once I read the Bible for myself, I'm able to accept the